Howdy and welcome to Burley United Methodist Church's worship service for Sunday, September 24th. We are glad that you could tune us in and hopefully by the music, the scripture readings and the humble words I have to say will nourish you and strengthen your soul. Our opening hymn this morning is Hymn of Promise. The call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 77 and the Apostle Paul's first letter to his disciple Timothy. I'll read the light print and I'll ask you to respond in the bold. Let us return to God who heals and binds up that we may recall God's constant presence. We will call to mind the deeds of God and to remember God's wonders of old. Press on to know the God of lightning and thunder whose judgments crash in on our murderous ways. God has redeemed our ancestors and led them gently like a flock. God pursues us wherever we go and searches for us when we are lost. We rejoice in God's steadfast love that draws us near in the company of friends. Please join me in the opening prayer. Immortal, invisible God over all, we quake before your creative energy, so far beyond our knowing and evident beyond our willingness to perceive. We live in your presence, whether or not we acknowledge you and we are subject to your rule, whether or not we choose to follow your way. Encounter us in this hour that we may not mistake our prejudices and preferences for your will. Through Christ, amen. Our next hymn this morning is Thy Word is a Lamp Unto Our Feet.
of the church is to pray. In prayer, we show God our obedience. In prayer, we show God our servanthood. In prayer, we show God our faith and our submission. So let us come and do that now. God of all nations, we thank you for your great power and might. For you are moving all history toward your good purposes and plans. Though nations wield economic, political, and military power that seems to rule the day, we trust that you are stronger still. We thank you that our systems of oppression and injustice are ultimately doomed to failure. We pray then for oppression to come to an end and for injustice to cease. So that people everywhere may live in peace and dignity. We pray for all those who sit in the seats of power to learn your ways of mercy and kindness. In our community, teach us to work together for the common good, caring for our neighbors and growing in understanding across every divide. Gracious God, we know that you are at work among the least, the lost, and the last. In the things that are unseen, that, you, that your heavenly reign does not swagger, but is subtle, coming among us in uncommon and often unnoticed ways, Give us eyes to see and ears to hear how and where you are moving and changing all things. Help us to look for your kingdom in the ways of children and others who are vulnerable among us. To seek you at the margins among those overlooked or ostracized. Humble us so that we may learn from those who are meek in all the earth. Life giving God. When our lives are dry and brittle, we trust that you can restore us to life, making us green again and fruitful. For anyone living with depression, chronic pain, or long-term illness, we ask for your healing and tender care. For those who have lost employment or the opportunity to be engaged with others in meaningful service, we pray for new opportunities to spring up for anyone who is coming to an ending, whether sought or undesired, we pray that a new beginning will open that promotes new growth and flourishing. Finally, dear God, no matter how small our faith is, we pray that you will give us good growth in our discipleship to you so that we may be faithful ambassadors of Christ, sharing his love and working for the reconciliation of the world. And in Christ's name we do pray. The prayer that he taught his disciples when they prayed to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In one of the books I have that I haven't read too much of, it is entitled, What If? The nice thing about the title of this book is that it's very inclusive. My book is about military history, but another book with that title could have been written about literature or authors or any part of history. What if in May of 1861, Colonel Robert E. Lee had accepted the command of Union troops instead of siding with his fellow Virginians? 
The Civil War would have been over in months and not years. But on a more personal note, what if? What if you won the Powerball lottery? What if our electrical grid no longer worked? And what if all of God's people prayed? We read in John's gospel, if in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. What if we as a church really got serious about prayer? I know that prayer is, is not a topic that is trending in social media. Has any other spiritual activity promised such power? Did Jesus ever tell me to preach without ceasing? Did Jesus ever tell us to teach without ceasing? Did Jesus ever tell, told us to hold committee meetings without ceasing? Thanks. Thank you, no. Did Jesus ever tell us to sing without ceasing? No, on each and every one of these accounts. But Jesus did tell us to pray without ceasing. Did our Lord say that his house would be a house of fellowship or a house of music or a house of activities? Not even close. But our Lord did call that his house would be a house of prayer. That is a big deal. I wish our annual conference would remember these words. Luke, not only the gospel writer, but also of Acts, starts his 12th chapter this way. And about that time, King Herod laid violence upon some who belonged to the church. Herod had James, the brother of John, killed with the sword. About what time is this? This Herod is not the Herod we read about in Matthew every Advent and Christmas, but his grandson. History had named, has named him King Agrippa I. His dad was the Herod we read, read about later in the Gospels, who ordered who, who, who met with Jesus and ordered the death of Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, and who had Jesus brought to him just hours before Jesus died on the cross. So now we have the third generation of toxic leaders in Israel, kind of like a, a first century version of the Kims in North Korea for the last 70 years. This James that had been killed by King Herod was one of the disciples who accompanied Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration and who was also there who accompanied Jesus into the Garden of Gethsemane just before Christ's arrest. The death of James was deeply felt by the early church, but not everybody in Israel felt this way. After Herod saw that James' at death pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the Passover. Herod had Peter put to prison and handed Peter over to four squads to guard him, intending to bring Peter out to the people after the Passover. In Jerusalem, at the time of the Passover, Jews were coming to the temple by the thousands. This was a great time for Herod to be seen and to work on his approval rating. Herod is there not because the people loved him, but rather because Rome expected him to be there and to keep everything calm. 
if the Jews approved of James' death. Peter's death would even become and make even greater fanfare. And once the Passover was over, Peter too would be finally taken care of once and for all. While there, Peter was kept in prison and the church prayed fervently to God for him. We now see the battle lines have been drawn. The power of, of, of Herod is over in this corner versus God and the praying church over there. Who will be victorious? Which should not be a surprise. I hope as we read this story that you imagine for yourself there in Mark's home, the writer of the Gospel of Mark as one of the faithful praying for Peter. That very night before Herod was going to bring him out, Peter bound with two chains was asleep between two soldiers while guards in front of the door were keeping watch over the prison. Unlike most of you, I suspect I've been to prison twice. Rest assured, just visiting the Oregon State Prison and also the disciplinary barracks in Leavenworth, Kansas, and four county jails where I was visiting the Army's less than brightest and best. Those inmates that I visited were not treated the way Peter was in Acts 12. When the inmates are asleep in their cells, the gods are not there, they're far away, they're just looking in on closed circuit TV. But here we read that Peter is between two guards, both within arm's reach. We would probably call Peter was in supermax, a super maximum secure facility. And those inmates that go into such a prison rarely walk out free. So in the midst of all of this, how do you think Peter is possibly lasting and dealing with the last evening of his life? Do you think he was anxious? Do you think he was having pain, so much pain that, that, that the chains were cutting off the circulation to his hands and his ankles? Well, let's find out. And suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell and he tapped Peter on the side and he, and he woke him up saying, get up quickly. And the chains fell off his wrists. Peter was asleep. Peter had been arrested before. Remember when he and John had, had healed the, the paralyzed man at the beautiful gate there in Jerusalem by the temple? He was arrested for that. So being in jail was nothing new to Peter, but he was not facing execution as he was in Acts 12. Why was Peter able to get so much sleep that night? Well, because of the Holy Spirit. And we read that without keys, his handcuffs fell off. And the angel said to Peter, Fasten your belt and put on your sandals. Get your coat and follow me. Peter went out and followed. He did not realize what was happening with the angel's help was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. And after they had passed the first and second guard, they came before the gate leading into the city and it opened for them on its own accord and he went outside and suddenly the angel left him. Prison guards have a very simple job description. Don't let anyone escape. If someone escapes, the best thing that can happen to you is that you take your prisoner's place. We are told in the book of Hebrews that angels are ministering, ministering spirits sent to the faithful to render aid. 
Angels are sent on specific assignments. You might have been visited by an angel at some point in your past. A person who helped you who wasn't supposed to be there. The person was there to assist you or maybe for a second or two and then they're gone. Like the, the big banner on the Abraham Lincoln on May 1st, 20 years ago, mission accomplished when President Bush was in the Persian Gulf. Later in Hebrews, we read that they have entertained angels unaware. Be kind to those whom you meet. They were probably sent by God. We know that angels possess power and authority to fulfill their task. We read in the book of Psalms, the angel of the Lord encamped around those who fear him and delivers them. How do you see your world? Do you see your world with human eyes? Or do you see that which is not seen with human eyes? Do you see, man, we're toast, we're beaten, we're goners. Or do you say, God's got this. In the battle of Sennacherib and his army in 2 Kings 19 against King Hezekiah and his army around Jerusalem, God sent just one angel that night to Sennacherib's army and 185,000 soldiers perished. No one was standing except Sennacherib. We read in 1 John, for the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world, amen. Angels are sent to pull this off, we read in Psalms. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. We come back to the story in Acts. And then Peter said, I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hands of Herod from all that the Jewish people were expecting. Peter is now free. And he needs to show everyone. He needs to show the faithful that he is alive and well. Peter went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark. And there many had gathered and were praying. And then Peter knocked at the outer door and a, a maid named Rhoda came to answer on recognizing Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the gate, she ran and announced that Peter was standing at the gate. So instead, instead of opening up the door, Rhoda runs back to everyone who was praying, leaving Peter outside. And, she, and they said to her, you're crazy. But Rhoda insisted, that it was so, and they said, it is an angel. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the gate, they saw him and they were amazed. He told them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison, and he said, tell this to James. This is Jesus' half-brother and the author of the book of James, and to the believers. Then he left and went to another place. Peter left because he knew that Herod's soldiers would be after him. And we know the rest of the story. We are told that when the prisoner's guard, because the prisoner's guard had a very simple job description, don't let anyone escape. And if someone does, the best thing that could happen to you would be that you would take their place. How that, I wonder how, how that works out for workplace morale. Rest assured, that those guards did not receive the best option for they actually received the sword of Herod who was very, very angry. People like Herod, 
never admit defeat. They will never admit that they lost. They just destroy people who disappoint them. From the beginning of the story until Peter stood before them, God's people prayed. Despite the state policy of atheism in East Germany, the pastor of St. Nicholas Church in Leipzig met regularly with his congregation for prayer starting in 1982. It took seven years for the prayers to work. Safe in the knowledge that the Lutheran church supported their resistance. Many dissatisfied East Germans gathered in the church and nonviolent demonstrations began to demand rights such as freedom to travel and to elect their own government. The demonstrations grew throughout 1989. Despite the authorities barricading streets, peaceful candlelit marches took place. Secret police issued death threats and even attacked some of the marchers until the crowd still continued to gather and pray. And it would take another two more months for the Berlin Wall that had stood for 30 years to come as we sing a tumbling down. Sometimes when God's faithful meets in prayer, things work out for those who are oppressed, for those who are disenfranchised, for those whose only power is the power of prayer. But I have been with many of you and we have bowed on bended knee and it did not work out the way we wanted. I will always be honest with you because as God's people, that is what you deserve. But to go back to the beginning of this chapter, we read that the death of the apostle James, one of the big three disciples of our Lord. Do you think the faithful prayed for his deliverance? You bet they did. The church is never capricious. The church is always consistent. The same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. First, we know that prayer is a priority through scripture. Pray, keep praying. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit and leave the results to God. Prayer is a priority. What did our Lord say when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane? He prayed that he would not have to drink the cup that God had set before him. But in 24 hours, Jesus was dead. Our Lord prayed so intensely that the blood vessels broke in his face. Three times. I have left my family to serve our country. And I know my kids did not pray. Please, Jesus, send our dad to Iraq now. Please, Jesus, send dad to South Korea or North Korea. We don't care. I know they didn't pray that. For I saw it in the tears on her cheeks as I said goodbye to them at the airport. Is there anything more sacred than a prayer given than by a three-year-old girl? I sure haven't seen it. Second, pray fervently. Pray without ceasing. When you pray, don't pull punches. Pray for help. Pray for healing. If you have an extended family like I do, then you do, then you have loved ones who are drifting further and further away from Christ instead of growing closer. God turned Saul. Saul called himself the chief of sinners, and God turned Saul around in an instant. 
Never hesitate to pour out your heart to God in prayer. And third, pray for God's sovereign plan. Those believers who were praying that night for Peter as he slept in jail were the same folks who had said their goodbyes to James days earlier. Rest in God's sovereign plan. Pray in God's sovereign plan. It is a mystery. When you struggle with that mystery, James died, but Peter didn't. Those are the facts. Doubt creeps in when we focus on the world's things and ignore God's things. The sovereignty of God is never in doubt. When we take on faith, when we take that faith, we take it to the grave and we take it beyond. To heaven. And that is what we take to heaven with us our faith. Amen. Join me in prayer. Loving God, we come to you this day looking for the one true direction. We live in a world where lies, deceit, and half truths are commonplace. We thank you, O Lord, that you seek. You speak to our souls with wisdom and about truth and compassion. We love you because you first loved us. Over the years, you have not always, over the years, we have not always been true and honest towards you. We've sinned because it was easier than being faithful. We felt no longer worthy of your love and so we went further astray. Thank you, O oh God for not giving up on us when we sought to forget you. Thank you for breaking through and reminding us of who you are. You showed your love for us by going to the cross for us. There paid for something that you did not to do so that we might gain something which we did not deserve. Our sins met your mercy on the cross long ago. You forgave our sins and turned and turn that degree of damnation into a license of everlasting life by nailing it to your cross. We therefore have been set free from the bonds and limits of this world, death to because we have life everlasting, the time we surrendered ourselves to you and ask you that you take over and guide our lives, that we have been set free. While our time here before we meet you in heaven, our years are numbered, and as we seek to use our time wisely, by pouring it out for you in the words I share and in the duties we perform, we are grateful and full of love. We pray these things all in your son's name. And all of God's people said, amen.
And our final hymn this morning is Trust and Obey. And as we prepare to go, no longer regard yourselves or others from a human point of view, but only from God's. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Go forth from this place, knowing that you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And may God grant you your heart's desire and fulfill your plans according to God's good will. Go in peace. Amen.